a meeting uh, Monday through Wednesday at 7 p.m. We'd love to have you back again and bring some friends along as well. Brother Hampton. Good afternoon. When I went to East Tennessee School of Preaching and Missions, the uh, previous director was still there, Brother James Meadows. I'm thankful to say he was there the whole time I was there. A very, very great uh, teacher of God's Word and a, and a good friend. Uh, we used to have him always speak, uh, at least briefly, at our orientation session. I'm going to tell you what he said because it might apply today. If you get sleepy, stand up in the back and keep taking notes. <laughs> Problem is, what happens if I get sleepy? <laughs> it was a, that was a great meal. It's been, it's been a wonderful day already. I'm excited to talk about uh, this particular lesson. I'll tell you why. Uh, it's because there is a rise now again, in seminaries of Calvinism. Uh, there was a fair period of time where Calvinism was on the decline in teaching. It had reached a low ebb of around 29% of seminary students uh, had been taught Calvinism. Uh, that number is skyrocketing now, going uh, way up. That is what is known as the Reformed Movement. There actually are reformed churches and have been uh, for several centuries, in fact. And so I thought we'd start out with this quotation. It is from Nathan L. Rice, uh, in, and he was a reformed preacher, and I think I've got that on a slide. I'm going to let y'all, I think I've got it. Yes, okay, because uh, you may want to follow along. Here's what he said in his debate with Alexander Campbell. We believe and teach that in conversion and sanctification, there is an influence of the Spirit in addition to that of the Word and distinct from it, an influence without which the arguments and motives of the gospel would never convert and sanctify one of Adam's ruined race. He might say, well, that was approximately 200 years ago. And I would say, you're exactly right. It was approximately 200 years ago. But the reform position has not changed. It is the same today as it was then. Uh, there is a belief amongst them that there, that there must be an uh, illumination, as they sometimes call it, by the Spirit for somebody to be converted. So it's very important today for all of us to understand how does the Spirit work in conversion. Certainly, I'm going to contend he does not work this way, but we must understand how he does work in order to appreciate the difference between the two, the biblical position versus the unbiblical position. And so we want to begin by saying you must, to be born, you must be born again of the Spirit to enter the kingdom. Look at John chapter 3. It's probably one of the best known passages Really, in the religious world, there'd be a lot of people uh, outside of Churches of Christ who would know a lot about this passage. You remember that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, and when he came to him by night, Jesus told him in verse 3, Most assured I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, of course, Nicodemus was uh, apparently stunned by that idea. He's a full-grown man. How could he be born again? Uh, could he, could he, and he literally says this, could I go back a second time into my mother's womb and be born? And then Jesus explains in verse 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then in verse 8, he goes on and makes this statement, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so as we look at this, we come to a realization. We've got to be born of water and the Spirit. That's clear. But then beyond that, we come to realize that that birth is not, 
is not something that is seen per se at the moment it happens. Instead, it's like the wind. You cannot see the wind, but you can see the impact of the wind. In much the same way, this thing that is, is uh, the, uh, being born again, this thing is not visible when it happens, but it's visible through the impact that it has on the individual. And that's the thing that we really need to understand. In Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to add one verse that I think may, may help us to clarify our understanding. Look at verse 1, where Paul says, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I want us to understand that as Christians... We are guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, it is imperative that you remember every lesson we've already done. In the second lesson, you noted that we talked about the Spirit speaks through the Word. That's very, very important as we go on down in this lesson to understand that the way that we are motivated by the Spirit is through the Word. We're going to see more about that as we go along. In fact, go on down to verse 14 where Paul goes on to say, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So we don't walk by the flesh. We don't do what the flesh, fleshly folks want us to do. But instead, we're guided by the Holy Spirit. To what are we guided? Well, we're guided to the new birth. Turn back a couple of chapters to Romans chapter 6, where in verses 3 and 4, the apostle says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, I've got a pretty simple question for, to ask today. I do not want a biology lesson and I do not want you to think in terms of sex education. That's not the point. I want you to just think elementary. How do you get a new life around your house? Well, if you got puppies, how'd you get them? They were born, weren't they? If you got a baby, how'd you get it? It's born, isn't it? Is that not right? So when Paul says, we are buried with Christ by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, watch it, in newness of life, what happened in the waters of baptism? We were born again. Not born physically. No, we go down into the, the water very much alive physically. But we're born spiritually. So the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter uh, 2 verse 1 says, and you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. How did he make us alive? Well, it's evident here in Romans 6, he made us alive through baptism. Now look at the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3, the apostle Paul picks up this theme again. Look beginning at verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, everybody, now you don't have to do this literally, but just imagine that you do. Everybody that used the word regeneration in the last week, raise your hand. Well, I can't even raise my hand. Uh, we don't use that word on a regular basis. So what does it mean? Well, probably we could figure it out if we thought just a little bit, but there will help us out. In his definition, he says new birth. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Regeneration, made alive again. You must be born again. How, is it, how does it happen? Well, here is what Paul is clear on. It does not happen because you or I earn our way into heaven. I do not do righteous works that make God be required to give me heaven. That's not what I, the way it happens. Instead, the Apostle Paul says that this takes place in the washing of the new 
birth. And how does that take place? Well, as you will notice, if you'll look very closely here, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, who taught us about all this. Through the Word, the Holy Spirit taught us how all this is to take place. So, be born of the Spirit to enter the kingdom. But then notice also, the Word is the Spirit's tool. Now think about this. In Luke chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus made a simple statement. The seed is the Word of God. Now, what, what is it about a seed? A seed has inside of it the germ of life, doesn't it? So in this case, when we talk about the Word of God, it is the germ of life that can help us to be born again. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 12, the Apostle Peter writes about it this way. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. Now, as we look at this, we come to a clear conclusion. And that is, when the gospel is preached, it is preached based upon what the Spirit has revealed. That is exactly what Peter says. Well, what is that gospel that is preached? Go on down to the same chapter. Pick up at verse 22, where he says, Since you've purified your souls in obeying the truth, watch it, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And so we have come to realize that the gospel was spoken under the direction of, or in the case of the New Testament Christians, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when that was delivered, what did they deliver? They delivered the word of God, which is what? It's the seed in which is the germ of life. Not physical life, but spiritual life, so that we can be born again. It all goes together, doesn't it? When you look at it, it ties together very nicely. In John chapter 6, we find Jesus speaking. He's talking to a crowd that, uh, as you very well know, in just a few moments is going to walk away from him. They're going to walk away because they don't like what he's saying. Uh, and they don't like it for a number of reasons. We're not going to talk about all those. We're just going to talk about something that he had to say. So look at John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. All right, now remember this morning we started with the colored pencils, right? So grab you another pencil. I, maybe this is blue. I don't know. I used green this morning. We'll pick up blue now. I want you to highlight, at least in your mind, if not in your Bible, highlight Father, verse 44, and then draws him. Father draws him. Now watch verse 45 and see where it goes. And it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Here you might want to underline a couple of words. First of all, taught by God. And then heard and learned from the Father. So here's what I want us to observe. If you put 44 and 45 together, here's the conclusion you come to. Coming to Jesus is equal to being drawn by the Father, and being drawn by the Father is equal to hearing and learning from God. It all goes together, and thus we're born again. We're born again by the Word that the Spirit delivered. And please be reminded of this. We've not covered it yet, uh, and may not get to in the whole time we're together. I don't know. But be reminded of the fact that the Spirit did not deliver His own words. He delivered the words of Jesus. And Jesus is quite clear on that in John chapter 16. But then notice something else. If you read the whole book of John, Jesus said he didn't deliver his own words either. 
He delivered the words of the Father. And so Jesus delivered the words of the Father. The Spirit only delivers the words of the Son. And thus, when we say God taught him, could God teach us through the Spirit what Jesus said so that we'd know what the Father said? And the answer is, sure. Why not? It works exactly that way. So the Word then is the Spirit's tool. Now, it's just a simple illustration. I try to help all of us grasp what I'm saying. <clears throat> what if I had come in here to the gathering last night, visiting with some of the folks, and I said, you know what? This past week, I had a hard week. I cut down a tree. How many folks in the, in the crowd, let's say everybody gathered around to hear this, this audacious uh, fellow from out of state uh, talk, and how many folks would think you cut down a tree? So you took a table knife and you just kept, you know, sawing away until the tree fell. How many would think that? Nobody would. Nobody would. Nor would you think that I took my teeth and bit my way through it like a beaver or something like that. Instead, you might say something like this. What tool did you use? And I might say a crosscut saw. Of course, I didn't need help for that. And Folks back home would say, yeah, you do need help. But anyway, uh, uh, we might have used a cross-cut saw, might have used a chainsaw, might have used a hatchet or an axe or whatever. Any of, those, any of those things is possible. But I cut down the tree. How would I do it? With a tool. When we talk about the conversion of a sinner, the tool the Spirit uses to convert is the Word of God. And that's the message that we're trying to learn. Then we want to find, observe, in addition to that, the Spirit's Word convicts and converts sinners. Now, you already heard that read, and thank you for that scripture reading. That's perfect. From uh, John chapter 16, it talks about that that is the ambition or that is the purpose of the Spirit, to convict and to convert. So now what, what I want to do is not dissect each verse we're going to have on the screen here but instead to show how it was that in each case these people came to understand what they needed to be converted. Because if you go through the book of Acts, and now you better grab a different color pencil. See, we used green, we used blue. Grab a yellow one. I don't care. Okay, let's start through, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to find out what was it that converted all these people in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. That's after they've said, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's after Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's after Peter continued to plead with them to beg them to save themselves from the wicked generation in which they lived. And here's what Luke writes. They that gladly received his word were baptized. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12, we find Philip going to the city of Samaria. And what do you notice about the Samaritans? It says, they believed Philip as he preached. In the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 35, here is Philip with that uh, Ethiopian nobleman. And what does it say about what Philip did? He preached Jesus to him. Oh, by the way, have you ever looked at Acts 8 and just, and just thought about it logically? With just human th thinking for a minute, it'll become very clear if you think about it for just, just a minute. He preached Jesus. When he preached Jesus, what did the eunuch say? See, here is water. What hinders me, or we'd say, what's stopping me from being baptized? Now, my question is simple. If you preach Jesus, do you preach baptism? And the obvious answer is, well, yeah, you've got to. As we've already observed, that's part of what? Being born again. That's how it comes about. So, yes, that's exactly the way it takes place. Look again, Acts chapter 9, verse 6. This is Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And could I make an, a, an observation? If there ever was a character in all of Scripture who might have miraculously been told what to do, 
This is the fella. Don't you think so? He's on the road. Jesus is talking to him. Here's the opportunity. Jesus could have spoken to him and told him what to do. Does he do that? Not really. Not at all. Instead, notice what he says to him. Go into the city. Watch this. You will be told what you must do. So Paul himself picks up the story, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And what does he say he was told? And Ananias came in. He said to him, and now what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Okay, some of you got notes from this morning. All right, what do we say about calling on the name of the Lord? Peter's quoted Joel 2, verse 38, where he said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We then observed that when they asked, what shall we do? Obviously to be saved. His answer is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, right? That was his answer. So calling on the name of the Lord must be repentance and baptism. What does Ananias say? Same thing. He says that baptism is calling on the name of the Lord. Now, add a verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, the apostle Peter says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you. I suspect I actually do, but I've not asked anybody. I put away my own filth in the flesh. That is, if I get dirty, I take a shower or a bath. And I figure you do too. That's the way we do it, right? As a general rule. But when it comes to saving myself from sin, I cannot wash myself. So not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but instead the answer, that's old English. And it's not a bad word because it meant exactly what I'm about to say in the day in which it was written. But it doesn't mean that anymore. And so if you look at the modern translations, more modern, like New American Standard and English Standard, guess what they put instead of answer? They put appeal. The appeal for a good conscience. In baptism, I'm pleading with God to give me a clean conscience. Now, some people would say, on the basis of your good work, uh uh-uh, that's not what Peter said. Peter said, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is a synecdoche. Uh, I told you. Mom and dad paid a lot of money for me to learn that word. Okay. What does it mean? You you might say, we don't talk like that around here. Well, you do too. (laughs) I haven't been to anybody's house here lately, but I'm going to guarantee you talk the same way. If I come to your house and I've been sitting there a little while and I finally say, you know what? I'm thirsty. Then one of, the, especially one of the widow ladies or one one of the uh, older couples, one of them will speak up and they'll say, "Well, just go in the kitchen and reach in the frigidaire and get you something." So I go in the kitchen, and they don't have a frigidaire; they've got an Amana, or they've got a Samsung. Now, if they're really old, they said, go in the kitchen, reach in the icebox. I guarantee you they don't have one of them, at least not a functioning one. What, is, what does icebox stand for? What does Frigidaire stand for? It stands for all, all cooling devices that we typically call refrigerators, right? That's exactly it. Now, what if I say, uh, I'm thirsty, and you, instead of saying, go in there and get it, you say, or I say, what do you got to drink? And you say, well, we got Coke. You, would you like some Coke? And then I say, what kind of Coke would you like? Would I, what do you have? And they say to me, what do you mean what kind of Coke? I, I've got Coke. No, you're going to answer more like this. Well, let's see, we've got Pepsi and we've got Sprite and we've got Mountain Dew and Dr. Pepper. Well, you don't even have Coke. <laughs> what would you use the word Coke for? Because Coke has come to stand for all carbonated beverages. That's a synecdoche, brethren. That's what that is. A part that stands for the whole. Could I give you a little sidelight to that word? Synecdoche is also the whole that stands for the part. So if you look at John 3.16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. 
Here's my question. Did Jesus die for the rocks and the trees and the grass? No. The word world there stands for all mankind, not the physical earth, the whole of it. So it's synecdoche. Now go back to 1 Peter, because that's where we launched off into this, you may call it a tirade, if you like. But what are we talking about there? When I appeal to God for a clean conscience, I appeal on the basis of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Now here's my question. Can you have a resurrection without a death and a burial? No. So what is he saying? In baptism, I appeal to God on the basis of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus to cleanse my conscience. And doesn't that exactly match Romans 6, where he talks about we're buried with Christ and we come up to walk in newness of life? Isn't it the same idea? Because like Christ was buried and, and was and rose again, even so we die, are buried, and arose and arise again. It's the same imagery that is in all those cases. And so, clearly, calling on the name of the Lord is done in penitent baptism. And we can prove that every time that idea comes up. In Acts chapter 10, verse 6, <clears throat> we find uh, Cornelius. And what does he hear? He hears, he, that is Peter, will tell you what you must do. In Acts chapter 10, verse 48, here is what uh, we find from Peter. And he commanded them to be baptized, listen, in the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 11, verse 19, we find uh, some men going to Antioch. This is before, uh, before Barnabas goes there. But they go to Antioch, what do they do? Acts eleven nineteen. 19, they're preaching the word. But in verse 20, it says, they're preaching the Lord Jesus. And in verse 21, it says, The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Turned to? Well, have you ever looked at Acts chapter 3, verse 19? Where there it says, Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The idea of conversion is a change, is a turning a turning from one thing to another thing. How do you do that? Well, Peter had already told it in Acts 2.38. You turn from sin to salvation in penitent baptism. It all goes together, doesn't it? If you really look at it, it all comes together. Then, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 14, we find this statement made regard, by Luke regarding Lydia. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. Now watch it. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Not the Holy Spirit illuminated her, but instead the word was spoken to her. Here's my contention. I've never had anybody answer it. My contention is there is not a single conversion in the entire New Testament, not one that took place to any other agency than a man delivering the word of God. How are you going to show that to your neighbor? Remember where we started? Questions. Questions. How were they converted in Acts 2? Ask, ask people. Was there an illumination of the spirit there? Well, not really. There was a preaching of the word, right? Acts 3, was there an illumination of the Spirit there? No, there was a preaching. Keep on going all the way through everything we've looked at already. It all comes together. And what does it come together to say? The Spirit's Word convicts and converts sinners. That's the message. So what have we learned this afternoon about the conversion of the Spirit? We have learned that we must be born of the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. We have learned that the Word is the Spirit's tool, and we have learned that the Spirit convicts and converts sinners through the preaching of the Word. So, I believe that we have demonstrated pretty clearly what it takes to be saved. We've done it by examining the cases in the New Testament, and particularly some verses in some detail. So there's not a soul here today 
who could not know what to do to be saved. That's already been delivered, hasn't it? So if you have come to realize what you must do to be saved and you're prepared, why don't you come while we sing? <laughs>